Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think we'll still have a few people joining over the next few minutes, but I think we should get started uh, so we have the full hour. Um, so my name is Ellie Lawther and I'm a member of the schools team here at CCSA. Uh, if you've joined us over the past few weeks, you'll know that CCSA has been hosting a series of webinars uh, for, with school leader partners on distance learning. Uh, we've been so inspired by all of the innovation that's been happening in the sector over the past couple of weeks and wanted to facilitate leaders sharing with other leaders. Um, as we say on our website, there's no perfect answer right now. Uh, there are multiple ways to address distance learning at your school, and a lot of schools are still figuring this out, which is totally okay. Um, today, we'll hear from three members of the Granada Hills Charter High School team, uh, Administrati Administrative Directors of Instruction, uh, Jenny DaCosta and David Bensinger, and Administrative Director, Jana Davenport. Um, there'll be about 15 minutes of uh, Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to submit a question, please do type it into the Q&A box rather than the chat. Uh, that's easier for us to keep track of and, and we'll make sure that it gets asked towards the end. Um, the webinar is going to be recorded and we'll send out an email tomorrow to all of our attendees uh, with links to how they can access the webinar. Um, and it will also be posted on the CCSA website. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to the team. Thanks guys. Thank you so much, Ellie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenny DaCosta and I'll be the one to um, kick off the webinar. Um, so I have the, the agenda up here. So we'll review um, a bit about us, uh, what we kind of did in anticipating COVID and the uh, history of our program, why we selected our online platform. And then we'll also address what that looks like for TK8 and the 912. Again, to reiterate what Ellie said, nothing is perfect. We're all trying to find our way through this um, new normal. And it seems that everything is fluid and changing and we're just learning how to adapt really well. So, um, or at least trying to adapt as best we can. I'll start with a little bit about us. We um, a conversion independent charter around 2002. We've been a nine through 12 until recently. So uh, last year or this year rather, we started um, our TK through eight with a, not a full platform of TK through eight and Jana will go through that when we get there. So we serve about 5,300 students um, and uh, That'll take us hopefully into, we're in the Valley, the San Fernando Valley. And, uh, and let's start with uh, moving forward with how we anticipated uh, COVID. Okay, so March 1st, we actually began planning for the closure. We you know, looked at the news, anticipating the worst possible things for um, what's to come. And then we met with our department leadership on March 9th after we developed an initial plan. We recognized when um, we were developing the plan that there needed to be huge flexibility and transition. I mean, everybody's dealing with something that we've never dealt with before. And that social emotional piece about that really need to, needed to be integrated within our plan. On March 12th, after meeting with the leadership, we were able to get some feedback with them and collaboratively put together pieces of our phase one. And we had actually already scheduled a period by period faculty meeting for um, the LCAP, which wasn't gonna happen, but at least we had that calendared. So we met with our faculty on March 12th and again introduced it as, you know, Everybody, if in fact we do um, go into a closure status, this is what we'll do for, um, for that transition time, knowing that things will change, information comes in constantly. So we were able to meet period by period with um, all our faculty and go over the distance learning plan while um, offering some training on certain pieces for those who you know, had different levels of exposure to the online, even though we have a one-to-one, -one, it was, um, people have different uh, skill sets. And then uh, that night we actually announced to all the stakeholders that we would be um, going into closure the following week. So 
The next day we did a minimum day, which allowed for more teachers to come and ask for additional training or what the plan looks like for the following week. And then March 16th, we started our implementation, but we really focused on transition. So we had something in place, but we really set that off with, you know, this is huge and people have to acclimate and we can't, you know, start day one as if everybody knows what they're doing. So we really stressed compassion and flexibility and understanding and, you know, trying to make sure that our staff is able to reach out to students through email just so that they knew that everybody was still there and there was still this this support um, structure in place, even though it's going to look differently. And then we'll talk more about the plan, but as we went into the first phase, um, we waited a bit and then surveyed our parents and students regarding the first phase. Like, how is it working? What does it feel like? Um, what's the workload? We have a um, POSIP survey that we use for parents, and then we use Google surveys for um, our students. Because as we refined, we really needed to take into consideration what this felt like for them before we implemented a phase two. So that's kind of what it looked like going into COVID for us. Uh, I know David's going to take over from here and kind of go over the history. Like, what did we have in place to allow us to move into these different phases? Okay, thanks, Jenny. Yep. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, and so I'm going to go a little bit further back to 2014. And even though it's not, uh, it's not the same, obviously, as today, um, we did have an outside push or an outside force that really kind of pushed us to make our one-to-one -one decision. And there are two factors with that. Uh, the first was that we had some Common Core funding that was expiring at the end of that year. Um, and then the second was that um, LA Unified had recently completed a wireless network installation. Um, our number had come up. And so we had this high speed network that connected basically every classroom and every point on campus to the internet. And so um, even though it's not the same, obviously as today when a lot of schools are, are facing a one-to-one -one decision based upon um, remote learning and school closure, um, we did have this outside force that pushed us towards one-to-one. -one. And so it was a relatively, for schools, a quick decision. Um, I believe our network was finished in January or February. And by March, we had uh, purchase orders in place for about 4,700 Chromebooks. And so as we pushed this program through, uh, we wanted it to be a comprehensive program. That was key to us, that every single student was going to have a Chromebook issued to them, and they'd never be denied access. So every single student on campus, regardless of grade level, we didn't pilot any grade level, we issued to every single student at the same time. And it was going to be a take-home program. It was going to be an integral part of the day that um, students would bring their Chromebook to school every single day and that they would keep these Chromebooks for uh, the four years that they were students there. So next slide, Jenny. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our first decision that we really had to make was which device to get. Um, we made the decision to go with the Google OS relatively uh, early on. Um, and the key here is that uh, the devices all function pretty much the same. And so the focus groups really looked at how do we use this? Is it durable? Does it make sense for me to take this home every single day? Is this something that students can really um, grasp and, and really kind of handle? Um, and the second thing that we did was we didn't buy for that year. We bought for three to four years out. And the key to this is that unlike a, a typical Windows or PC, Chromebooks don't slow down as much. Um, what they run becomes more, becomes a little bit more um, intensive on graphics or more intensive on the web, but the Chromebook itself doesn't slow down. So like where um, you go and turn on your five-year-old PC and go grab a cup of coffee and it gets slower and slower, the Chromebooks that, that we purchased today are going to pretty much work the same four years from now. And so the next thing that we wanted to do was we made sure that we bought an extended warranty plan that matched the device lifespan. And key in that, um, specifically for the school environment, was that the battery needed to be included in that plan and that battery needed to last the entire day. So the other piece we wanted to do was make sure that no student was ever designed access to a Chromebook. 
And so we do, we bought about 5% of additional inventory. Um, now in our second phase, we just use our older model as you owners. Uh, but if a student forgets to charge it, which is the number one reason why they would need service, um, we'll swap out that device and it takes about 30 seconds to do that. Uh, the vast majority of problems are fixed with this device swap. So it's a very easy way to make sure that students always have that device. Uh, the next thing that we did was we purchased a device where our tech team and other team members were trained on how to, um, trained and authorized by the manufacturer on how to service and repair these devices. So we didn't send this off to anybody else. If a screen is cracked, we repair it on site. If a battery needs to be replaced, we're gonna repair that on site and order directly from the manufacturer. And the final thing that we did was make sure that we gave our um, students and parents peace of mind uh, in the sense that they're now carrying around probably the most expensive device in their backpack um, and wanted to make sure that if they put that backpack down too hard, if it were lost, if a screen is cracked, um, they had uh, this insurance policy or this protection plan. So once we got the device into everybody's hands, we need to make sure that our teachers had the support that they, they needed. And one of the things that we did was we, we really restructured our, our technology department to focus on the end user devices that the students had as opposed to the network itself. Uh, what we also did was work with them to adopt this yes attitude. So instead of um, saying no and, and, and not allowing our teachers to experiment, we wanted to open up everything to them. We took the attitude of try it and see what happens. Um, we centralized purchasing to avoid duplicating licensing. Um, a lot of times it makes sense once you get above a certain number of licenses to buy a site license. So we just wanted to make sure that we knew uh, who had what license so that we could avoid duplicating those licenses. The next thing we did was we didn't, we didn't push our teachers towards one application or one platform. We didn't limit them to Google Classroom, we preferred it. But we also recognize that when students leave um, our school, they're going to experience different platforms in, in college or elsewhere. And we also recognize that different academic departments are going to have different needs as well. So we didn't limit our teachers to any one, um, one platform. That being said, Google, Google Classroom and, and the Google platform became the one that the majority of teachers gravitated towards. And the next thing we want to do is make sure that teachers have the tools they needed to manage the student behavior in the classroom. So if that's a lockdown browser for testing, there's a variety of classroom monitoring tools that teachers can use that sort of thing. With regards to our students, we wanted to make sure that they would learn by the end of their four years and now by the end of their, their 14 years with Granada, what we wanted them to be able to do. So we didn't do like a, we don't do like a boot camp. We have a summer program, but that's where we really integrate learning and using these apps into the actual uh, instructional program itself. So they'll learn how to use Google Docs as they're, as they're writing and sharing an essay. They'll learn how to use Sheets as they're working on a spreadsheet in their math class. And we also wanted to make sure that we treat when, when students make mistakes, which they'll do, treat those as a learning experience. Meaning that we use our technology and our, our tech team really works to make sure that when a student makes a mistake, if they send an email out to the wrong person, if they send something inappropriate out, we try to contain that within the bubble as much as we can. Um, all activity, both uh, on site and at home, is monitored um, and guided by us. Um, we have ways that we can restrict access to students. We have ways that if a student still doesn't know how to use that device at home, we can do a, a check in and check out at the starting end of the school day. And then finally, that um, we use a uh, we have a very strong detention program at Granada, a lot of rules. And so we were able to use that to really help um, manage the, uh, the traffic, for example, of students forgetting their device and hold that to a pretty consistent level with that program and integrating that with our existing um, behavior management plans. So the other key thing is that we looked at both Chromebooks and access to the internet as a fundamental part of the instructional program. And this was key because before we, we went to one-to-one, -to -one, we used to consider the access to the internet to be sort of a privilege, not a right. We flipped that around and said, under no circumstances are students gonna lose this access. We might restrict it if they're, if they're um, having a trouble managing it themselves, but we don't take away that access. It's like a paper and a pencil. Um, and we also need to know that student, that teachers could could rely upon this internet, that they could assign homework that required, it, required internet access. And so 
early on, we had a partnership with T-Mobile. Uh, it's called the Empowered Empower Ed program, where we received a grant for hotspots for use at home. And we right now we have about 150 to 200 hotspots that we check out to students every single year. And so before I uh, kick this back over to Jenny, um, the Google Suite for Education, really what drove our choice was we were rolling this out to an audience of over 5,000 um, students and teachers. Um, like Jenny mentioned earlier, of, of very different um, technological levels and, and um, of ability and comfort. And so we needed something that was easy to use, promote a collaboration, and really um, also wanted to make sure that the cost was right. And so with Google Classroom, which has become pretty much our primary tool during remote learning, um, it's a tool that really, it's very easy to navigate. If you use it, you're familiar with it, that it's, it's, it's very simple, it's very logical, it's very straightforward. Um, although it's not a true learning management system in the sense that it doesn't contain the curriculum itself, it's a great um, supplement to the physical classroom, in this case, a replacement to it because it allows teachers to, to digitally manage the classroom, pass out papers or assignments and receive those papers or assignments back and then also really allows for scheduling of both um, the synchronous learning and the asynchronous learning. And so with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Jenny for a little bit. Thanks. So even as we move forward and looking at how we use Google Classroom, it's great. Um, we've been using it for quite some time. So as we moved into the distance learning piece, it was a, a good transition. Uh, we needed to you know, get refreshers um, and uh, get teachers to use uh, Google Hangouts or different aspects of, of the uh, Google Suites. As we look forward, hopefully after COVID and um, moving into the future, we do want to, there are other online platforms. Um, I know one that's very popular with higher ed is Canvas. Uh, it's one that I'm partial to. It's, it's user friendly. Um, Schoology, not so much, uh, in my opinion, or Blackboard, but uh, still user friendly, but just the, the, the Canvas um, design um, is, is really good. And if we want to get our students, you know, our 12th graders or 11th graders, and they're going to the UCs or the Cal States, and, and it's not just used there, it's used in other private universities to get them acclimated to what those online platforms will look like since so much of higher ed has moved into using um, those um, online platforms. So we'll fast forward now. So we go into uh, COVID. So we, what do we do for our distance learning? Um, in the initial weeks, we were still unsure about what this entire thing is going to look like. So for the 912, we focused on the, um, the 4,700 uh, student push out of asynchronous instruction. There were certain things that we needed to modify as we moved forward, but to at least set a, a base, it was asynchronous in the initial weeks. Um, for the TK8, it was asynchronous and synchronous, which Jana will speak to. We put uh, initial resources out there. Um, by March 16th, which were designed by department leadership. And then the focus was using a Google Classroom for the primary connection with our students and families. So with that, I'm gonna kick it on over to Jana and she'll tell us how we uh, implemented the TK-8. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm Jana Davenport. I am the administrative director for the uh, Granada Hills Charter TK-8 through program. And like Jenny mentioned at the beginning, uh, the program just opened uh, in August of 2019. So um, we, of course, like everyone, were completely unprepared for this transition. But I will say that the benefit of uh, having just opened the program was that uh, everyone on board was extremely nimble. Um, you know, nothing uh, had been become a tradition or set in stone. Uh, we were constantly looking to revise our practices as a new school and improve uh, in every way uh, on every front. And so um, when this came around, uh, there was, you know, again, just um, a reliance upon the collaborative spirit that we already had in place. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but uh, we only have uh, as background transitional kindergarten, kindergarten, first grade and sixth grade as we roll out um, a five-year enrollment plan 
till we get to, um, to full enrollment in about five years. And so all the lovely infrastructure that, uh, that Mr. Benzinger was talking about was already in place for us. Um, and we did partake uh, here at the TK8 in the one-to-one -one Chroma program, um, even down to our youngest scholars, um, our kindergarten and transitional kindergarten first grade, all got uh, a one-to-one -one Chromebook. Uh, and we rolled that out because um, computer science was a part of our curriculum, even at those young years. Um, but as part of a balanced program, the students didn't have a lot of screen time. They weren't taking the Chromebooks home, but it was an important part of our curriculum. And uh, I will say that um, the Chromebooks and uh, allowed our having the Chromebooks allowed our students to have that familiarity with the technology um, when the COVID shutdown uh, came along. So um, let me start uh, by just you're looking at the online resources uh, that we're currently using um, for our distance learning. And I wanted to speak a little bit um, at the beginning about our communication platforms. Um, I personally use Blackboard Connect in order to push out um, communications to the whole school, um, but the teachers uh, and the individual classrooms are communicating through, uh, through the Google Classroom primarily. And I, I'll preface with this, that um, the parent lines of communications with both teachers and administration was key before the shutdown. And it is the foundation, in my opinion, for the successful transition to distance learning. If there's not that effective homeschool communication, uh, if it wasn't there before the shutdown, it's certainly the first thing to establish for successful distance learning. Um, and so in our preparation for the shutdown, we streamlined our communication platforms. Some of our teachers at the beginning um, were using uh, Seesaw and ClassDojo and Remind as um, supplemental forms of communication as well. And when the shutdown occurred, um, we really streamlined into, for our teachers, the Google Classroom model. And we did that for a number of reasons. Um, similar to the high school, uh, we wanted the features that Google Classroom provided to us, the ability to post assignments, to archive all our communications and documents in one location in the drive, um, to log grades and have them visible to our parents um, on Google Classroom, to video chat, um, hangouts, meets within the classroom, and then the ability to assign other teachers to the classrooms, including myself, so that we could continue to collaborate on instructional practices and resources that we were providing. So um, again, that collaborative piece with each other, the effective communication with parents was all part of our line of thinking uh, as we prepared for this shutdown to um, streamline into Google Classroom. Initially, we prepared packets for the little ones and materials to go home on short notice. Um, and then in anticipation of the extended closure, um, our grade levels and content areas uh, got together to identify those essential skills, the core content that had to be focused on um, in the distance learning with now less time and less contact with our kids. So um, we also you know, did that home assessment uh, for needs um, regarding internet accessibility and access to devices at home. And in those early um, days and weeks, really just made sure that everyone um, had access to the instruction that we were gonna provide. So you can see the learning resources um, that we've uh, narrowed down in TK, K1 and 6. Those are the, primarily the, the apps and websites um, that we're pointing our kids to. So let's start with sixth grade. Jenny, you can move us yep. to the next slide. Here, um, are some of the instructional resources that we're providing to our sixth grade students through Google Classroom. And you can see that I have access to, um, a, it's just a, the image is just a partial list of some of the classes, the classrooms that um, are set up, but we're using e-textbooks and workbooks. Uh, we're linking kids to articles. The teachers are creating their own slides, PowerPoints. Um, of course, we're um, using some web-based applications and video lessons that the kids can access. And then for our world language, we're also providing um, access to online speech to text tools so that the kids can continue to practice um, and converse uh, in the world languages that they're learning. Um, and then so beyond that, um, we've put together a launch schedule. So our sixth grade meets in cohorts. Um, so uh, the students check in three times a day, once with their English and history teacher, once with their math science teacher, and then once again with their world language teacher for synchronous meetings. 
Um, and the meetings can are flexible. The teachers can deliver a lesson. They could take a few minutes to explain assignments. They could hold a Q&A if teachers wanted to kick offline after that initial meeting or lesson, um, they could do that. Or if students wanted to stay online and get individual support or ask additional questions in small groups, they were welcome to do that. But our teachers felt strongly that the students need um, and should be expected to check in with their teacher uh, in a live meeting daily. Um, that accountability um, really uh, was there with this regular ongoing daily connection leading to, to just greater engagement um, and motivation and inspiration for our kids um, to see each other's faces and hear and have their answers question, uh, questions answered. And so also um, the teachers having those, those daily meetings, then they're also providing Google Hangout office hours um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the accountability piece, but we are providing flexible due dates based on everyone's unique situations in this crisis. Um, and then regular email communication with parents and monitoring of attendance and work completion. And so um, on sort of a, uh, say, four to seven day window, our teachers are checking for work completed, uh, even though the due dates are flexible, so that um, they can reach out and communicate with parents if um, if missing work is starting to pile up. Okay, so the next slide, we'll move on to our elementary grades. And of course, um, as you know and can imagine, the elementary grades um, look a little different, um, mostly because we really have to be sensitive to um, the supervision, the caregiving um, needs that, um, first, that the elementary kids need. And so our, um, our teachers were really actively communicating um, with uh, the parents of their classrooms to provide sort of a tailored model for each classroom, asking what people's schedules were, um, who was watching the children, and when kids would have access to the technology and someone to supervise, help them log on. Um, and so the expectation right now for our elementary uh, classrooms are that um, teachers are providing three, between three and five live sessions per week. Um, daily reading, daily math, the web-based applications, and lots of links. And I'll show you in a minute the schedules um, that our teachers are providing. They provide two things, a weekly learning goal, the objectives that um, need to be, or we'd like to see met um, for the week. And that way parents can see sort of long range for the week and uh, plan accordingly, uh, different ways to, to reach the objectives with their students. Um, with the support of the daily schedules, which are really provided for a little bit more structure for those parents and families who want it. Um, and then we also have some parent training links for the math and the ELA foundational reading routines, so our parents can engage too if they want to and have time to, um, to support their students' learning. Um, and the, flex the accountability at, at elementary, of course, is flexible as well. Um, the apps that we're using that are web-based generally have an accountability um, piece to them where they can keep track of students' individual progress. Um, but we don't want to rely solely on that because as we know, these kids may not be um, um, completing, you know, the web-based apps, um, the tasks and skills um, on those apps um, by themselves. And so, you know, we take a, a variety of different measures um, of different ways so that we can keep abreast of um, what our kids are able to do through photos and videos and scans of completed work. Okay, so in elementary, we provide a weekly um, objectives for our content areas. And then um, you can see that there's a first grade at home learning schedule. So it's a daily schedule that we provide and it starts at rise and shine, which helps a lot of our families um, to provide some structure for the day, which is what they're looking for. And you can see that there are those live links um, that the teachers are providing to different activities, different tasks, um, and then our teachers during the live instruction are doing a number of things, but one of the things they are um, doing consistently is rolling out instruction via a PowerPoint or a slide deck rather. Um, the Google Slides Productivity Suite is very helpful. And so the parents can, the teacher can go through the slides with the students in the Google Hangout. Um, and the parents can also, they, we have explicit instructions for them if they'd like to help support their child um, um, at a different time. But you can see um, those images are from the um, Google slide decks that our kids are providing. Okay, so um, I think 
that that's pretty much what's going on um, with the elementary program and I'm going to shoot it back to Jenny. Okay, thanks, Jana. So the distance learning uh, phase one uh, for 912 was asynchronous. Um, pieces that we focused on for our faculty were the department hubs. These were key. So we knew um, when we were initially planning that everybody had a different skill level when it came to finding resources online and using online resources to help uh, supplement their classroom. So our department leaders put together department hubs. Um, these were places where all teachers um, within that discipline would sign up and then they would get access to those department hubs and our um, leadership would put in resources aligned to all the different courses offered within that discipline. And then we went through the pieces that were required in the asynchronous instruction. Um, every teacher was responsible to have their own Google Classroom so they could go to the hub, grab a resource that they needed, and then put it in their own Google Classroom and design lessons around uh, that content. And then again, the first week of implementation really stressed flexibility and compassion and understanding and knowing that it's fluid and things are going to change. So to, to be patient to at least try because we are all in it together and trying to find our way through it. So it, the Google Hub it was basically um, the resource center. So for people to feel safe and secure, um, if they were stuck, they didn't feel like they had to go search for something and find it all on their own. We do have department leaders and um, instructional leaders that really are good at grabbing this material. So we were able to pull on their talents, which was awesome. And they created these awesome places for teachers to look in and grab some resources for their own class, at least for the start of the week and to take them into the next week. And then the teachers were um, required to use their own Google Classroom. Uh, they had to develop a schedule that included two videos or lectures. Now we, those who are really good at doing that, we said, all right, you, you know, you might already have a, a, a library of lectures um, that you've done throughout the years, so you could post those, or you can go to other online resources, um, or even post a primary source document, or you're going to post a short story, whatever you're going to do, there's going to be two of those, um, to also implement assignments that take no more than three hours a week. Um, and then we said that they needed to communicate with their students at least two times um, during that week. And communication could simply look like um, one of the postings in Google Classroom, because we know everybody is struggling to figure certain things out, um, at least an update. So students know that, oh, there is some normalcy going on. I do have some information coming in from my class and my teachers. And that really helps kind of root them and, and give them a home base. And then they needed to put office hours for um, their students. So we said, you know, design a time where um, it's two hours. You don't necessarily have to be um, on like video conferencing with your students, but it's a time for students to know that, oh, I know my teacher is there between this time and this time. So if I email my teacher, I'll be able to get a response back within this time, as opposed to waiting 24 hours to get a response. And then we also um, didn't want to go beyond the one grade per week. We wanted to make sure that um, there was a balance that um, somebody didn't feel like they had to push out 15 grades a week or do this ridiculous amount of work as we transition to this really new kind of um, learning platform. So we wanted to make sure that at least there was one grade per week um, and to not go beyond that in the first uh, stages. So then uh, after we surveyed our students and our parents to figure out um, what we needed as we found out we are going to be going into this remote learning for the remainder of the year, we needed to um, make some adjustments. We knew that the asynchronous time, um, we knew office hours were overlapping. Um, we knew that the students, uh, some students felt like the three hours was balanced. Some students felt like the three hours was overwhelming. 
you know, everybody has unique situations and we all need to be sensitive and understand. And our teachers are also, you know, balancing their own lives and um, their own schooling with their, you know, own children. So there's a lot to consider when we're moving forward to um, going into a full complete semester closure. So really the only pieces that we wanted to add to our asynchronous was synchronous, right? We wanted to make sure that there were live sessions and then to make sure that there was no overlap. So that engaged um, a very uh, difficult but and challenging conversation, but at least it was um, rooted in the place where we needed to have our students to have equal access to their teachers and not have to make a choice of which teacher to you know, talk to during which time because of the overlap. We also wanted to make sure that our students with disabilities were receiving um, all of their intervention. So we wanted to add those learning labs. And then we wanted to make sure students had access to our tutoring online. So we do use a tutor.com um, site and, and product, but we also have um, a really in-depth peer mentor program in math and English. And we were able to, with their uh, teacher leaders, put them into an online platform as well, which was really great. So for example, um, students can write essays and they can submit them to our peer mentors. And our peer mentors have worked with our English teachers and the um, English teacher leader to really refine what the English department is looking for in writing. And then they provide that feedback to our students uh, online. And then our continued virtual mental health services. So we needed to make sure everybody was aware of the, um, the services available to them and how to access them. Even though emails have going up consistently, we wanted to make sure um, it was very clear. Uh, uh, and then um, we scheduled um, our departments. So we needed to make sure what is this time? And we wanted to make sure that everybody um, wasn't overwhelmed. We wanted to balance teachers' lives as well as um, students' lives. Um, making sure that there is access. So within these blocks are actually mini master plans, so master schedules. So we are not having teachers in a live session for, you know, two hours. The live sessions for each one of these um, individual classes are between 20 and 30 minutes. And, um, and that's only twice a week. So it was important for us to make sure that there, there was access and um, real-time access to our teachers with our students so they can go over the curriculum, they can ask questions, the students can ask questions that you know, teachers you know, don't always anticipate um, in, a, in a way where everybody can hear it and everybody can be addressed. In one of our surveys um, to our students, that was one of the key pieces that even posting online um, the assignments, they really craved the um, explanation piece where they could ask some questions and get a little bit more in depth and some direction for the assignments. And then um, we closed with the, uh, the teaching expectations. So there were a lot of pieces to go with that schedule, right? We needed to be clear on what a Google Classroom looked like. We wanted to make sure that students had enough time for um, completing assignments. We still didn't go beyond the three hours. Um, and we wanted to make sure that there was no conflict when um, teachers put due dates on assignments or due times on assignments and it's not due during another uh, class time. Uh, we put out parameters for professional development, um, what the live instruction should look like, um, and communication again, so reiterating that two times for the communication with our students, um, what a response time looks like, and then we went into grading and what that participation looks like, as well as attendance and the continued office hours. So that is actually, we're currently in our spring break and this will launch now um, on Monday. So that is basically what we are doing right now for uh, COVID and um, 
and uh, we're still trying to find our footing and dealing with certain things as they arise. And um, this will be a time for Q and A. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, if anyone does have a question, please go ahead and type it into the Q and A box now, and we'll read those out. Or you can raise your hand, and we'll take you off mute. We'll just give people a few minutes to sure. think of their questions. Um, so we have somebody who joined late um, and they said if it wasn't addressed they'd love to hear about assessment and just to let you know um, that we, we have recorded this webinar too so you'll be able to go back and uh, listen to the part that you missed. Sure so we are working on assessment that's one of the pieces that will come back over um, after spring break with our leadership with the um, with the grading piece, we made sure that there were directions in terms of assignments, but for the, if you're talking about finals week or that final assessment, our professional development with our leadership is now um, designed to really refine what the next six weeks looks like for each of um, the uh, disciplines and everybody's class to align with what are the key essential skills that students really need to walk away with by the end of this um, semester. So we have the conversations with our teachers to say, it, this looks different. It's not, we're not going to um, class every day physically together and, you know, being able to give the assignments that we've traditionally, you know, implemented um, in the past. So now we really need to have clear discussions as um, discipline specific teams to say, what do we agree are those key essential standards and skills that the students need to walk away with by the end of the semester. And that's actually um, a process that we'll engage in throughout the rest um, of the closure because um, we'll have to do that every week. We, we know that um, those are bigger things to tackle with our staff. We also gave the example of the um, AP and the college board um, shifts with their um, assessments. So it helps our teachers to reframe what exactly is important and what we need to be looking for um, at the end of the semester. So using the college board and how they have shifted their assessment really um, helps to frame the assessment conversation. If I could just add a little piece from the TK8. Are you guys there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, here at the TK8, we are, um, we're focusing really on, um, on more on formative assessments right now um, as we're just getting off um, into sort of a groove with the distance learning we're focusing more on uh, feedback to students accurate feedback meaningful feedback um, more so right now than grading because everyone's situations are so unique um, that we feel that accountability needs to be there of course um, but if we want our feedback to be meaningful and accurate and drive um, instruction so <clears throat> those live sessions, honestly, um, are really important for the formative assessments because that's the personal interaction where you really um, are able to see what kids understand. Where are their questions? Where are the holes? What do we need to address tomorrow based on what is being asked today? So checking for understanding during those synchronous sessions, listening to student questions to inform instruction for the next day, um, in office hours, using that time to, to check for, um, for understanding and realizing that that formative data, um, it's a process to collect it, to find that evidence of learning so that we can drive instruction and real learning forward. Um, and so that's where we've been putting our focus right now um, with the TK-8. 
um, understanding that um, there are so many situations going on in the home um, and that grading is something that still um, needs to unfold. That's really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, we have one more question, which would be, um, someone is curious about how your leadership is going to decide or evaluate if, if the program has been successful when you come, when you come back to it in the summer. Have you had, have you guys thought about that? Oh, yes. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously we, we, um, we need to engage every stakeholder, right? Not just um, parents and students, uh, but also teachers. So actually, as we implement this first week of the phase two, we'll be surveying our teachers to, to say, okay, what's working? What are the challenges? What are we doing? Um, what do we need to refine? Um, as we come to the end of the semester, and given that, you know, summer school, we traditionally offer summer school will most likely look different as well. So we'll need to really uh, use the surveying um, with our, with every stakeholder group uh, to figure out what really worked when we did phase one, um, what really worked with the phase two implementation to see how we can refine for summer and um, even moving forward, maybe what we can integrate regularly into our traditional brick and mortar classrooms. Um, now that everybody's, even though this is a crisis, everybody is gaining uh, different skill sets that mm -hmm. hopefully we can um, move into the future with. So definitely it's going to be through survey. And again, we use passive survey, which is really a fantastic tool. Um, we've received the most parent um, feedback from that tool than in years past with any other survey that we implemented. It's, um, it's through uh, texting and it's um, really only three targeted questions um, bi-weekly. Uh, and it, it helps us because we can, we can um, really uh, craft our own question based on the designated need for that period of time. And then um, our students have been able to be super responsive, which is great. During this time, we, we got thousands of um, responses from our first survey going out. So, and we even surveyed the sixth graders and get some responses for them too. So it's really great to uh, hear from them. Um, and then our, our teachers, uh, we need to get their feedback as well. So it will be through that surveying that we will do that in order to refine. So the survey has been a huge help. Um, huge. Yeah, huge help and, um, and given us some really um, targeted um, feedback, which is always helpful. Um, one of the other measurements um, that I think we're all using and especially here at the TK8 is we're, um, I won't say we're measuring a success of the program by this, but um, we're certainly monitoring it as um, part of um, what we need to look at to determine if we were effective. And that is just sheer engagement and participation of our students. Are they checking in to their live meetings? Are they participating um, in the instruction that we're providing? Are they completing work, um, whether it's in a timely manner or not? because that really speaks to, and for lack of a better word, the doability of what we're rolling out, right? Are the meeting times reasonable for our students? Are the assignments and tasks reasonable for our students? Um, if our kids are checking in, participating and engaging, right, by logging in and being there, then um, that's obviously, you know, the first path to being effective. They're right. motivated to be there. They're inspired to be there. They're getting their needs met, both hopefully both socially, um, emotionally, and academically. Um, that their and teachers Google are Classroom there for allows for that in the TK through 12. So being able to monitor that activity is really helpful um, through the span of the school. Yeah, exactly. And that's then something that each teacher would keep track of, or that, is that something that you look into on the back end? So each oh. teacher will keep track of that, but we'll also look into it that um, on the back end. Okay, that's really interesting. Great, um, we have one more question, uh, which is, can you share any guidance on how you're implementing SPED services and evaluating the efficacy of online SPED? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's great. Yeah, at the, T, at the TK8, um, um, our SPED services are, to the best of our ability, being delivered virtually. So um, those instructional minutes um, are being provided to our kids through like a Zoom breakout session. So our, um, our special ed instructors are joining in on uh, the live instructional sessions, listening to what's rolling out with the teacher, and then breaking out um, to provide services to our SPED students. Um, and then also holding office hours for our SPED students to get um, additional support. Um, so we're doing it virtually as best we can. And at the uh, 912, we um, are also doing it as best we can virtually. The added pieces that we have, um, in addition to the office hours and the, um, you know, the actual specific scheduling and reaching out with the students um, from their resource teacher, we are doing the learning labs that are incorporated within the actual um, daily schedule and then um, our co-teachers. So with Google Classroom, we have that, you know, co-teaching piece. And um, so those teachers are um, teaching together for when we have designated co-teaching classes. Great, thank you. Um, any last questions coming in from, from our attendees? We'll give you one more minute to, to put those in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay, I'm not seeing anything else, uh, anything else coming in. So I think we'll, we'll end the Q&A session there. Um, thank you so much. This has been a really, really informative webinar. Um, we just really appreciate you, appreciate the three of you taking time to, to jump at the opportunity to share your process with us today. Uh, we know it's been a pretty hectic uh, time for everyone and especially coming into the, the Easter holiday. Um, Thanks for having so, us. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, we will be doing a quick, uh, speaking of surveys, a quick survey at the end of this webinar. We'd uh, appreciate it if you guys could take a minute, uh, attendees, to, to fill that out. It's just two questions. Um, let us know how this went. If you have any feedback for our presenters, I'm sure they'd appreciate that too. Um, and like I said at the beginning, we will make this recording available to you all by email tomorrow. Um, and it's also available on our website. Um, so with that, just want to uh, wish you a happy weekend and I hope you all stay safe uh, over this period. So thanks again very much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.